Welcome to Onyx and the World of Oil Derivatives, a podcast that lifts the veil on the opaque world of financial oil trading. Brought to you by Onyx Capital Group. Oil Derivatives Deciphered. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Onyx and the World of Oil Derivatives. My name is Greg Newman, and I am the CEO of Onyx Capital Group. On today's episode, we're going to discuss commodity trade financing and its role and impact on oil derivatives. We are also going to discuss the investment banking role and also how it's evolved with the rise of the exchange and the increasing transparency, competition and ultimately regulations that has led to the demise of investment banks as the dominant force in market making and the services in oil derivatives. With me today to give context and discuss is Chris Newman, who is my brother. Chris joined BNP Paribas in 2008 before working there for six years and then moving on to launch a commodity physical trading house and then on to Audentia Capital, which was founded in 2017 by Chris and where he remains as managing partner. Audentia Capital is a credit fund whose primary function is investing in principal commodity transactions. Thanks very much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy. I started BNP actually as a graduate, um, but I joined, uh, I guess, a desk that was uh, derivatives focused, but particularly around um, hedging more transactionally. Um, If we talk about um, generally how uh, banks were running derivative divisions at the time, um, obviously, some of the revenue or a lot of the revenue uh, for particular banks was coming from proprietary trading, but the bulk was coming from hedging corporates, you know, airline, shippers, so on and so forth, managing price risk, obviously, in the future. Um, this particular area that I was working in, though, was more transactional in a sense. It was related to hedging of transactions uh, at physical level, uh, of which uh, BNP Paribas was by far you know, the world's leader of, of commodity uh, financing at the time. I think uh, at one point, they're financing like a one in six barrels globally um, of oil and, and obviously other commodities. And um, yeah, I guess in terms of a precursor to uh, the commodities industry, this was probably the best one you could have in terms of um, mm-hmm. being you know closely linked to physical, but at the same time, understanding that from a sort of derivative um, structuring and, and price risk management background as well. So just taking a step, step back, so BNP Paribas back then, and this was... 2010, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, 08, ecosystem of oil which has many different types of transactions and financing going on and the rest of it and at the time uh, and still to some extent we've got the banks leading the way in financing physical transactions and therefore you know traders are able or needed the banks or need the banks to trade oil around the world we've also got the clearing services which allow uh, you know traders like onyx prop traders trade houses to have access to the exchange traded market which is purely the derivative market and then they're all interacting with each other physical traders come in and want to hedge using the exchange market so you know if they have financing of the physical they can therefore get clearing services from the banks and the rest of it and Paraba and the investment banks were very much at the center of that and in addition at the time they were offering all the services and the market making and everything around it that's how it was back then and actually you got Interesting context, remember we always used to talk about with Paraba was in the 08 crisis, they were in really good position because a lot of it was a dollar-led crisis essentially. And Well, subprime, so, you know, Beam and Paraba wasn't really involved in subprime okay. crisis. So as far as 08's concerned, you're not talking about just a market move in, you know, financial crisis. You've got to remember that oil prices and commodity prices collapsed three, four hundred percent as well, right? At mm. the same time. Mm. So, in terms of a stress test in the industry, this is probably the biggest one in the commodities uh, area. But in terms of um, where we positioned at BMP, it meant that we had a lot of negative. Well, there were a lot of, uh, sorry, positive mark to markets with banks that could go under, obviously. And oh, this yeah. is, you know, it was extremely, I guess, alarming for 
big corporate scale hedges that you know with oil collapsing their their money or their that was being you know created from these hedges were sitting with banks that could go so under in particular the producers of oil forward hedging <coughs> on the sell side had profited from the from the down move on a derivative basis but that cash flow was bilateral so just to explain it when chris first started i think you could probably answer this better than me but the market wasn't dominated electronically or at least exchange trade at the time. A lot of it was still bilateral transactions. No, right? almost 100%. I mean, NYMEX Clearport didn't even exist then. That's fascinating. So the, the, again, the big, biggest move relevant to oil derivatives is that when Chris started, it used to be, as he said, almost 100% bilateral. So i.e., you know, counterpart to counterpart having agreements between themselves. So a lot of counterparty risk. That's been centralized now within an exchange and gives a lot of people more access there's been a lot more derivative volume on the back of that. Well, uh, also transparency, right? And transparency. Yes. We could talk more about that. Yeah. But just staying on this topic, follow on what you were saying. So that so the cash flows people were worried about who had the positive mark to market, wanted their money, obviously, but were worried they weren't going to get it. So they were trying to push it all over to Paraba. Is that what yeah, so a lot of transactions were innovative, but at the same time, you know, in, in general, business was coming naturally to banks which were perceived to be stronger from a balance sheet perspective mm. from a, where where it was positioned in, in its activities because obviously subprime was yeah. you know the precursor to global financial crisis so this time was kind of interesting for several reasons i think firstly you're in the sort of end of a commodity super cycle which probably started in 2002 so chinese boom and, and, and you know i guess tiger economies exploding in terms of use of commodities exploded demand for commodities exploded price for commodities and therefore financing of commodities use of derivatives for price risk management so we were in this cycle and suddenly global financial crisis hits mm. uh, and bnp paribas and by banks like that i mean there weren't many that do financing at the same time as doing investment bank derivative risk management right. activities yeah. at the same time as interacting very closely to, to physical through financing um, was a unique space to be in because you don't often or would, shouldn't really get exposed to that yeah. being within a bank, right? That's not the typical activities of a major bank, but BNP was number one in the industry for that. So well, this is what's so interesting about your story, I think, because you started off wanting to be a trader, I think, on the face of it, you know, just generically as a graduate coming through ended up showing, you know, they wanted you to be in sales, displaying the right characteristics, but actually it's probably the best thing for you because you got to get started with a lot of transactions in 08 as people were doing what you were saying, moving over to Paraval. Yeah, and also were... this this sector was quite short dated transactional stuff. As I say, it wasn't portfolio based, you, you know, it was an area that not all banks were in. So it became a lot more uh, important to the bank in terms of from a revenue stream. But as I said, because not many banks finance physical commodities, that also has a derivative. Yeah, yeah. Um, that made it a unique position to be in. And, you know, I guess life's part of, you know, your exposures, being exposed to this early allowed me to understand physical yeah, in a level that, you know, is obviously quite unusual, that allowed me to transition into building a physical trading uh, business, you know, not long after leaving. So funny, so, only when you look back at it, because I remember it all. I actually interned with Chris for a time. And, you know, I just still remember it all, like as in it was at, at the time, banks were very much still dominating the oil market in this sense. But again, to be clear, there's the clearing services and the bike that, you know, Parab offering bilateral transactions. So if someone oh, wanted to... It's more like extending credit, right? So yeah, you take credit, credit risk on, on counterparties. When someone wanted to trade derivatives, when someone wanted to hedge, they would trade yeah. it with Parab, Parab would take the counterpart risk and, and yeah, whatever else. Yeah, this is still within the confines of OTC. And in it the is. case of financing, the right. bank wanted the counterparty to hedge because it's effectively hedging its own but, financing. But to be clear to everyone, that's the point I'm trying to make, is in like the banks, even though they can seem as this like one thing, really it's two completely separate things. It's well, free if you include so clearing. It's another right. completely end. Right, yeah. So market making, clearing, and financing. financing physical. And so yeah. financing physical is obviously a hugely capital intense thing. You need to finance these cargoes that are notional values of hundreds of millions. At the time, yeah. At a time. $120 oil for sure, yeah. Yeah, and oh yeah, oil was at times when Chris was around in this area, $100 plus. So big, big capital requirements to finance these transactions. But this is what's interesting. So that you just were there for the complete transition. We had absolute dominance of the banks in terms of, I would say, risk management services, extending credit, uh, market making, and then of course, separately, um, the financing, the physical, where Parabo were quite strategically placed was they could do both. And we could talk about- Well, there's one last layer as well. Go for on. the derivative side, banks were also dominating proprietary risk taking. I yes, mean, you know, commodity were, hedge they? funds didn't really exist then, yeah, directional so commodity hedge funds. So 
you know, banks, American banks in particular, derive much of its uh, top line revenue from proprietary risk taking that wasn't wasn't something that you know even that's physical true. traders were doing massively yeah, at that yeah, time, yeah. right? Yes, yeah, so fascinating. So that's what. So so then we had this transition. I would say really kicked off what 2012, 2013 is when exchange trades start to pick pick up massively, right? Yeah, I think counterparty credit risk became a topic generally across the financial system after the financial crisis. Mm. Basically, people perceived that credit risk was one of the biggest issues in terms of systematic risk that caused GFC in the first place and therefore across the whole banking or financing the financial system, uh, sector everyone was looking at ways or monitoring counterparty credit risk mm. and one of the I guess core ways so someone some regulator somewhere decided that this would be uh, uh, let's say mitigated was by centralizing counterparty credit yeah. risk i.e. Yeah. having clearing right and yeah. that, that didn't exist before right so it was preeminent in commodities for sure so as soon as the exchange traded market started to be in a place where you could actually gain traction, could actually trade it and get your, your requirements done, essentially, to get liquidity, mm. that followed very quickly with the demise of at least the market making element of banks and the service providing. So I yeah, don't know that what came you think. more from a compression of margin perspective, like clearing yeah. itself. If yeah. you were competitive at trading, it shouldn't make a difference yeah. how that transaction is and to be to again to just define it clearing we're talking here if a bank will offer clearing services they're basically taking ownership of your positions that you're trading on the exchange so it's actually the bank that takes the risk the bank takes the again counterparty risk on you but then knows that there's a low default risk on the exchange is happy to fund your exchange trading basically so the collapse of margins because we went from there being mostly bilateral to mostly electronic and on the exchange which meant the exchange could more succinctly report numbers so yeah you it just increased transparency basically but and, and by it, meaning but, reporting like you would literally get up on the platform this is what's traded last so you couldn't hide it yeah as one layer but i think more importantly is that transparency in this situation also means you have price transparency i.e if you can trade with more counterparties you mm. get a more competitive price yeah which forces you know those who are trading effectively just on credit through captive market the inability to sort of and captive you mean as in like they, they couldn't trade anywhere else exactly right? so they, 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 Goldman's or Parabo whoever is offering you a credit line and you need a price you have to go to Goldman's to get that price if they're the owners if providing the only credit ones. right so now yeah. suddenly it got rid of that yeah yeah well it's diluted it a lot I diluted mean it. you know obviously clearing has its own sort of challenges because more often than not if you're talking about clearing you're also talking about funding margin yeah whereas OTC it is pure credit right mm. so mm. Um, that is another point to note in general but as I said just in terms of market change in terms of why or how derivatives let's say became more transparent more compressed in terms of margin is purely a function of transparency and therefore more competition, more people providing prices, more people taking, let's say, axed risk, and therefore you're more likely to be matched with them. And then, yeah. you know, obviously as a point, you get a lot lower margin. So that is almost... So why can why, I mean, okay, so the other thing you said was the proprietary trading was a big part of banks. Yeah. So proprietary tra trading was diminished probably mainly because of Dodd-Frank. Volcker. Sorry, Volcker. Volcker really, right, yeah. yeah. Volcker ruling, which basically said you couldn't you couldn't have directional risk, as simple as that. Well, yeah, within reason. I mean, obviously you could take some if it was like a proxy hedge, but, but definitely not an independent desk. Yeah, within and a bank. Yeah, no. Chance. The other thing with that was I'm not sure exactly when it came, but Mifid two now says you can't offer research on the markets for free either. So the bank's model, largely speaking, within the services of market making, was we offer the price that you need, we can give you the credit line, we can give you the research. And all of this should be great for you to get what you need to trade and obviously risk management services as well, how to hedge, all the rest of it. And in return, the bank would make money out of you know, the, the bid offer, the, uh, the market making. But then actually, also with the research, with the seeing everything, great information to proprietary trade. So now they couldn't make any money proprietary trading. They couldn't offer research. And now suddenly you're just relying on just market making. And again, you were there for it. The more electronic and exchange traded things became, the harder it was for banks. And why weren't banks able to keep up with just the market making function? Why is it such a function that now this opened the door for Onyx in particular, right? This is what we do. We market make uh, and, and trade these like tight margins. But why did the banks not keep up in your opinion? Uh, some did to some extent, but you know, let's start with the first layer, competitiveness of price. Right, you yeah. know, that comes from first layer being axed, 
that can be you know obviously the, the most obvious way that you want to do the deal and it suits what your book is looking like at that particular time and therefore mm. you know rather than pay for it in the market you want to do it directly and you want that trade so you're priced competitively I think separately the um, I guess and it's, it's, it's an extension of that point that when you don't have proprietary risk-taking model anymore you know you have less uh, capacity at one point like a directional point in time for there to be an axe mm. so you know, right. proprietary aside, if market's very low, you're not going to have producers coming in to hedge, mm. right? So, you know, who's going to be axed, mm. right? And the reverse, obviously, when the market's very high. Mm. But with proprietary trading activity, someone could be axed because they're very, you know, they, they actually have a very aggressive view. And it creates competitiveness of being able and to when absorb. we say axed here, it means so, for instance, an example might be they want to be, they're bearish and they want to sell. So they sell, um, you know, a particular contract. And therefore, if someone comes in and asks for uh, to sell something as well, they're already short, so they can offer a competitive price on the buy side because they're already in the money. They're already in that well, direction. It suits directionally what they're booked. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can price more competitively as a, point, as a result of that, right? So if you take that out, like I guess there's a secondary layer, is that when you have a less captive market, it's very simple. You can't mm. just charge people whatever you want anymore. Yeah, so right? you can't it charge just, what you want anymore. And also, because you don't have an axe, like you're saying, why would you show a market blindly to the to the market? Well, that was often, very tight you know, margin. probably the biggest arguments between sales and trading there ever was, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, a client clearly wants to do a transaction, but, you know, at the same time, seeing better numbers, but at the t that previously couldn't because of the credit. So it yeah. exposed a lot of people for not really being traders, being yeah. more, I would say, f pseudo brokers, because yeah. they just back it out into the market and take a spread. Well, right? actually, what you see in retail broking, which is they don't charge commission, they just charge a bit offer, and they make money within the spread. That, yeah. is, that is what retail broking is. Yeah, but like I said, I mean, you, when you when you mask that with, but I've got credit on a big counterparty, you know, that's where you can fatten the margins, which just has become less and less and less possible. Yeah, it's yeah, quite yeah, simple yeah. as that, right? I mean, yeah. there aren't many people who are pure risk takers within a bank who are happy to sort of sit on a position to create a, a super competitive price that can beat an axe, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. But the other thing, I guess, I'm not talking about is part of your role was definitely exploring and explaining and educating how to hedge and being clever with the hedge and used to come up with crazy like niche option structures for refinery margins and the rest of it like it's more that, that was more like if you take the vanilla hedging stuff when i say transactional it's like a cargo of oil being bought and sold and that's but how you hedging. would instigate a trade so at one point you were yeah. sitting in the bank saying i can lend credit lines to counterparts uh, i can offer them our research i can offer them a good price and ultimately, the way, the, probably the primary way you, you were getting business or getting trades done was by risk management advice. Yeah, so the sector I was in was, was for sure risk management, but also I would coin it as uh, monetizing physical optionality. This is more precisely to do with physical trading, just a lot of these sort of things that are inbuilt in physical commodity tran transactions, things like volume tolerance and so on and so forth, have an embedded optionality to them. And... If you apply real option theory, which is what I was doing, to those type of, let's say, contracts, it's about monetizing the value of choice, which has an inherent value, an intrinsic value itself. Right? Yeah. So we don't always, or I guess, look at the, the fact that you have a choice to do something is worth something in itself. And then, then there's the value of the choice, right? As in, you know, what the decision is, right? So there's two layers, intrinsic and extrinsic value. And that's actually how option theory really works. You pay a premium for a potential mm. outcome, right? Um, what the value of that premium is, in most cases, is zero if you value the choice at zero. Right? Well, this is how complex it got. I don't think anyone else, definitely no one else was doing this at the time. But once you started to gain this Yeah, conceptually, this area, it's, not, it's not that complicated. I know it's not to you, but as in ultimately having done it, but from the outside in, you know, if we talk about option theory and we don't want to get too complex, but ultimately... You're talking about if you were to say buy an option on like a forty-five dollar call option in June next year, June twenty-one. What's factored into that premium price you're paying is someone on the other side saying, "Look, if you pay me this amount, I can essentially manage the risks associated with with taking on that option, uh, with figuring out, you know, as Chris going on about the complexities within it, and you know, there's loads to go on about it, but I don't really want to talk about option theory, but ultimately." You were applying that kind of methodology, which is purely financial and very popular in the financial world. You were actually attaching that quantitatively to physical transactions. So this is going to be too complex, even for you me. Just to it. I, I, I get it, uh, but it was. I remember you valuing doing choice, it. valuing choice. I get it, but you were getting the quantitative guys to help you, and all that. it was like a you know it was, it was rain man structure, crap yeah. going on. So 
ultimately, um, I guess in a nutshell, what you were providing that no one else was able to provide at the time was if we take something like volume tolerance. So volume tolerance on a physical cargo, let's say take crude, if it's 600,000 barrels, and that's the standard size for say uh, a BFOET clip in the, in the North Sea market, in the agreement, I think it's the seller's option, it can be both. Actually, it's buyers in the North Sea. That you have, you can basically minimize or maximize up to one percent in this particular. It can be anything. I know five normally. But let's just say, okay, one percent. So basically, whoever's option it is, they can say when actual delivery, actually, I want six hundred and six thousand barrels, or I want five hundred and ninety-four thousand barrels, and that slightly alters, of course, the price. Um, or if you've agreed a price, you can basically optimize on top of that. So creating option structure within that was definitely unique at the time uh, and uh, you built your own niche out of that but I guess we kind of went fast forward there because that's what you were doing to stay ahead and get people to, you know Parabu would then would then value. price yeah exactly yeah. but they would then price the option make money out of the spread and that was a great revenue generator but you know to me that's like having gone through the rest of it which is simple risk management services like I want to I'm a producer and I want to sell okay well why don't you just sell a swap or why don't you buy a put option you know, you're going way beyond that. Was that because there was just in your time running out of margin in the traditional vanilla hedging? Was was this transparency, the exchange also coming with this transparency and education? People understood what producer selling was all about and they didn't need help. I on think that. the question is more about not that they were selling, it was how they were selling. And not I don't think many people ask that simple question because you don't just sell a cargo of anything. There's so many different parameters in the way that we would sell from inco terms onwards mm. that do have an impact on risk effectively. And that could be as simple as the formula, but it could also be um, a sim- something like, uh, yeah, some form of like uh, inherent optionality within the structure that hasn't been captured. So, you know, in very simple terms, yes, margin was, was let's say, collapsing for um, very vanilla stuff. But although this seems exotic, this is more about exploring further the world of physical trading and, and the way things work and to better understand are there better ways of hedging right and, and that's really what it came down to i get you but as in what i'm saying is did you notice so you know there was definitely it was definitely marketable to say look i can come and, and it is still today i mean it's not it's not it's not really easy to understand how to hedge generically it's just we know it because we've been in the market for a long time yeah. but <clears> that generic advice saying if you're a producer you sell and this is how you do it and this is how you choose your contract did the margin start to diminish in that trade in your transition and that's why you then explored this uh, or as a consequence of and I guess what I'm saying is did that did that coincide with the demise of the banks the, the risk management advice being kind of generically out there now and no one really going above and beyond and yeah you know, things I mean, you were doing you can talk about impact dilution of you know rebasing of market understanding of something I previously if you didn't know how to use derivatives and what you would do to hedge would have been something that you had to be, let's say, educated on yeah. and understood. And But once you understand, then you're now in the execution phase, which is more of the market was in execution phase. Right. And I understand how to hedge. Yes. But and why would you think that was linked with the exchange? Hundred, well, 100%, because now you have the capacity to understand how to hedge yourself. But, but why? But why? That's what I'm trying to say. It's interesting to me. Because the well, exchange... you're talking about a function of time as well, right? So yeah. over time, from 2008 to when the clearing was, people's understanding of hedging was, was improving. Yeah. Why is that? Because more people were having to hedge, right? Or wanting to hedge. Able to hedge more transparently. Okay. Yeah, yeah these are all sort of factors. But don't forget as well that volatility mm. at this point in time was over 100% as well. Mm. You know, we had $12 down days on all sure. at some point. So, you know, in Even terms if of, you were doing a short term, you know, buying some cargo. Yeah, between now and tomorrow, you could be $12 yeah, down on a, so, on a million barrels, yeah, right? Yeah. The, the point is, is that it, it's, it's a perfect storm. Clearing was just one aspect of it. Clearing is really a catalyst. Clearing exposed those that weren't really trading and they were working on captive markets to those who actually want to take positions and trade around them because it's the only real way to stay competitive against a market that will naturally have access that you couldn't mm. a- access before. Mm. That's really what it is. Clearing provides access to so other did, counterparties. What did you used to call this option stuff you used to do? Monetizing physical optionality. That's okay. really what it was. And then you got it started to be used in other banks? Um, to, not really, to some extent. I mean, it's more the approach of the structure. But rather where did than the opportunity the, go? As in, the price of the structure became competitive, and that's no, where. no, no. Even on that, I mean, um, we're still we would we, we describe as more of an exotic area of derivatives here, just by virtue of the fact that the product you're creating is got a non-linear payoff. Yeah. Um, 
But in terms of the structuring, what made it unique was I understood physical from the bank only ever financing physical. So you're looking at really at transactional level what is happening rather than like a portfolio type hedge, which you mm. would do with a corporate. Right? I guess so, what I'm getting at here is that sounds so niche. There's no, there's never going to be an exchange traded price for no. the structures you were putting no. in place. There was an understanding of the trade finance side of Paribas. Yeah, I'll give like, you an example. If you're going to be shorting an op, be short an option, i.e. someone's going to sell you your option against their options or okay. against physical, yeah. it's got to match something like a BL. And the BL is always changing. But what I'm saying is, given all that, yeah. given how niche it is and bespoke it is, how does that not keep Paribas in the game for market making for, that's what I'm saying. Because we're overall talking about the because demise. It's not market making. That's really the bottom line. It's not part of a market making function. It's more about. But you still need the price of the option, which is non linear. Like you say, it still needs to be generated bespokely. The yeah, market maker provider but, still needs to come up with that price. Well, that structure, that there isn't the person to create the structure, is the point. Oh. So I, it kind of went with when financing in the bank um, today yeah, actually doesn't even exist. They pull out. Yeah. I mean, that, that, I think that actually kind of ends that discussion with market making service providing it, it, you know it made sense if you were looking at it from the outside in why would you try and compete in that space you can't proprietary your trade the risk management services are pretty well known transparency in both the price transparency and education was just to the point where there's not too much edge you can provide unless you're very 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 specialist and it makes sense that probably towards 2013 2014 there was pretty much no banks in the market making function I mean, day to day, and that's well. The last note you're forgetting is that the only thing that you had an edge on, yeah, was providing credit for counterparties, right? And right. that was less needed. Well, there was just simply less commodity derivative banks. You know, we had at one point fifteen, probably. Yeah. Probably today, it's less than five. Well, that's with a, like a dedicated commodity derivative right. to market function. Well, that's where we're at today. So you know, quite literally in the last few months, especially with the crisis financing of physical where the banks were still operating in and are still to some yeah. degree very much required commodity trade finance is very very important to this business without it we're going to struggle to have a functioning derivative market because there's going to be no one who can hedge or needs to because they can't get financing of the physical so the importance of it can't really be understated in terms of the functioning that's one thing but having said that I mean, I've got some statistics here. Just generally speaking, the revenues are falling quite considerably in the trade finance area. So the financing of short, you know, short-term loans, essentially, to finance the movement of commodities, let's define it like that. That revenue in the, in the commodity trade finance area have been declining year on year on year on year. So the li latest ones, ABN AMRO have pulled out, Paribas, like we're talking about, they've now pulled out. What generally is going on here and what does it mean now? Because we need this function for the market to, to continue to grow. It's a huge area. Um, get an answer on that, but then of course, where things are gonna go, and then ultimately, where Odentia sits in this. Um, well, I think, you know, in terms of the function of commodity trade finance, um, it's probably worth just creating something more, a little bit more contextual because you can link everything to it. In very simple terms, if I have capacity to buy $100 million worth of oil as a trader today and sell to someone else for $101 million, okay, that's my basic transaction. Mm -hmm. Except today, I don't have $100 million worth of cash. So I go to a bank and I say to the bank, hey, I need to borrow $100 million for 10 days because that's yep. how long it takes to move. Mm -hmm. I'm buying from him and I'm selling to him. Mm -hmm. First question the bank's gonna ask is who are you buying from? Well-known producer, major, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. Who are you selling to? Because obviously this is where the credit of the trade comes from, right? Mm -hmm. you know, you're exiting this transaction against this counterparty, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's, it's this guy, trader B. Um, and okay, and how do you know he's going to pay you? So, mm -hmm. Oh, because he's providing me a letter of credit, which is effectively a payment security from another bank, mm -hmm. okay, to, to pay, right? Mm -hmm. So the bank says, okay, I'll lend you the 100 million against this 101 million dollar LC, plus I want to keep title of the oil, i.e. the bank still owns the oil itself, right? If you default, it takes the oil. Mm -hmm. This is trade finance, financing trades, right? Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. simply. Now, if we just take one step back in terms of talking about the balance sheet of banks and how banks look at from a regulatory capital perspective, which is another theme going on behind all of this regulatory change in derivatives, MIFID two and so on and so forth. This is more around Basel three and, and subsequently Basel four, which we're about to come into now. Regulatory change around 
making the bank system more uh, safe, right, from, from a purely from a regulatory perspective. And this happened as a direct result of global financial crisis. So Basel III, more or less, the big changes were across the bank, you need more capital in general. It doesn't matter what, what section. Just to interrupt, just saying, yeah. so, so all the things we were talking about previously uh, were um, like Volcker rule. These are all targeted to sort of derivative, derivative specific. specific stuff. Yeah. We're now getting at very much a core of a bank's function, which is lending. Yeah. And yeah. now the regulation on that is actually completely different. And when did you think that's so Basel III came in? Yeah. When uh, was that? The last, I think, implementation of it was about three year phase in was mm. Jan 19. Jan or March started 19. When? Uh, I think three or four years before, about 15, I think it started. Yeah, okay. So, so typically what happens when they do regular changes, they have like this, you know, check with the industry kind of thing and yeah. everyone piles in with their opinions and so on and so forth. Eventually they get some draft paperwork, they get some, you know, discussions around that and so on and so forth. And then you start to get what's implementation phase. So you have this long to get your house in order and mm -hmm. it comes in phases, mm -hmm. right? And, and the last phase, as I'm saying, of, you know, capital increase was... Uh, I think, yeah, Jan or March, I think March 2019. But, but in any case, this is generic, right? This is yeah. not just, I'll get to commodities in a second. Yeah. Just banks in general had to start looking at things in, in a different way. Firstly, capital is now more expensive mm -hmm. simply because each transaction I do, I have to put more of my own money down, mm -hmm. right? So I'm less leveraged, right? So I make less money. Mm -hmm. So what do shareholders care about now is return on capital employed, simple, right? Shareholder give you money, money used in whatever the functions of the bank, I have to put more of that now, I make less money. Suddenly, a lot of divisions, just on the basis of you had to put more capital down, were starting to be strained from an economic perspective. And this is across all banks, doesn't matter what function. Specifically in commodities, which is in interesting, is asset back lending. Because now with assets, I, in my example, I was using oil, $100 million worth of oil. Mm -hmm. On the bank's balance sheet today, it's not worth $100 million from a regulatory capital perspective. Right? And there's various reasons for that. But principally, without getting into the calculations and rules, conceptually, we are talking about $100 million worth of oil being worth, say, 80 on a bank's balance sheet. So what that effectively means is the bank is having to fund 20 million more of its lending right, than it had to previously. These are just example numbers. They're not specific. But what it effectively means is the bank now, if it hasn't changed its yield, which it hasn't, it's getting capital constrained, right? But I thought when you say regulatory capital, there's the regulatory capital that you need to satisfy <coughs> the minimum capital requirements. Yeah, that's across the bank. So why does that lead to, why do you say 80 and 100 in that example? I'm giving you an example of this, of a, and it's, it's more or less that, it's credit conversion factors basically, more or less the value, value change of a collateral that gets reclassified on a bank's balance sheet by virtue of what it is. So if it, let's so just- Just because it was oil, just because yes. it's oil, they go, yeah. it's worth 80, not 100. Uh, yeah, as in, well, there's layers to it. It was like, well, you don't own that. So oh, another trader owns It's like that. slippage. It's like accounting for slippage. Kind of, it's a bit more of a haircut applied, effectively. Okay, so right? the, the notional is worth 100 million. And they're oh, worth, economically, yes. Economically, they know it's worth 100 million, but they're saying, look, let's factor in some safety here. Exactly. Let's actually value at 80. Yeah, let's say, okay. and the reasons for that are that there's some practical reasons, right? Like, yeah. you don't actually own, where is this oil, yeah. so on and so forth. Like a flake, like, the market yeah, yeah, move. Exactly. So but then what does that mean? Okay, so following that logic, so it's 80 million. In so a degradation of collateral value from a regulatory capital Understood. perspective. And yeah. why does that, why does that matter though? It is matters it? because the bank can leverage less because it's got to put more of its own money. So, so back the bank it, right? is also borrowing to get that 100 million. So it needs to borrow even more than it was before. Which is going to cost them more. It's than not it necessarily have. boring. I mean, there is a, there is a funding exercise in this, but it's capital. Bank has a finite amount of capital, and, you're and it deploys it to a division that now needs more right. and is making less effectively. Okay. A lot of divisions just shut because yeah. the economics didn't work. Right? Very very high notional stuff, for instance, like some areas of illiquid credit or bond markets where you're trading billions to make like one one thousand dollars. Well, this is what I was going to say actually, because you started as saying, you know. Trader A, let's say trader in Asia, yeah. trader in Singapore, buys a cargo and agrees to sell it into an Australian refiner yeah. um, at $41 and he's going to buy it at $40. He has to have said to the bank to get the financing that he's going to make a dollar. Oh, yeah. Well, it's and not just that. Where's your payment security? So they have to have negotiate the contract, sorry, yeah. the deal yeah. to the full extent before they even ask for the funding. Yeah. And therefore, that for oh, it to no, be no, worth you it, just, You're going to get to one stage before, but yeah. Okay, but the point is, is that a dollar per barrel, look, that is, I mean, if I made a dollar per barrel in derivatives, you know, I'd be laughing. But even in physical, from what you're saying, that dollar per barrel that they're moving, that they're going to make money, that they know they're making money, 
it's got to be worth all the financing of capital and the costs and we can get into that, you know, the freight, all that kind of stuff. And even then, if they don't get agreeable capital terms, lending terms, that could completely erode that margin. Yeah, but historic yeah, yeah, but historically banks could fund with no capital. It was just easy. You just said, yeah, okay, understood. Yeah. Because you'd look at the value of so let's talk about in mortgages. Sorry, can I just finish that? Yeah. What I was trying to say was yeah. we were talking about transparency before. Yeah. So in this transpa- as well, in derivatives, but then now that kind of has physical, a knock-on effect on uh, physical. Physical margins are slightly different, but there is a similar theme there. But what I'm getting at is the physical margins must be must have eroded with more transparency. How, but you need at least this natural arbitrage buying in Singapore Centre Street. You need there to be an arbitrage for you to be able to. Be, to why would you do you it? About any form of trading. It doesn't matter if. But that's what's moved. insane. You're you're having you know you're trying to make this amount, but you don't even know. Like everyone knows where the market price is, so the market becomes so competitive because you're going to push it to the very limits of oh, what's an arms race right now. So like who arms gets race. access to credit? Right. So really, it's nothing to do with before it's, it used to it's, be. It is partly. So if we follow the history, right? Commodity trade finance, dollar for dollar lending, very profitable for a bank, super low risk, right? I think the actual historical default rates are like two bips for mm-hmm. bank trade finance, and that's why everyone wanted a piece. Everyone mm-hmm. wanted to get involved in this market because, you know. Getting was, access to capital was cheap, not the yeah. Well, it was whatever. almost free, right? Yeah, because yeah. you know you didn't need this regulatory capital down because you'd say, "Hey, regulator, I've got hundred million dollars worth yeah. of oil as a collateral. And Why do I need to put more capital yeah, down?" Yeah, 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 yeah. So when this starts to degrade, you see the impact of collateral values, and and there's a separate point here, which is the impact of changes within the financial system, how it impacts the commodity world, right? It's not yeah. that's not a well known understa- uh, thing. Sorry, even though still to this day, commodity traders get financing probably 90% plus from banks. So as in 90% is in any 90% of their 10%. global funding yeah. is going to up to 90 it can be 100 in most cases but big traders have you know a large majority of financing still coming from banks today mm-hmm. right so impacts mm-hmm. here have a domino effect mm. and it's a lag but it's it's a domino effect so if we go back to the example 100 million dollars worth of oil only really being worth say 80 as an example from a regulatory capital perspective mm-hmm. what you get now is an opportunity where the global financial system from a commodity trade finance perspective is being strained, i.e. they can lend less. Now, this is away from all of the other sort of historical issues that have happened within commodities because, you know, ultimately a lot of the counterparties here we're talking about, just by virtue of where commodities come from, are frontier or emerging market companies, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or countries, sorry, uh, in where, uh, where producing assets are, are, are coming from, right? But, but sticking with... The banking system, if we're talking about just what's happening in financing, it's quite simply much harder and less economical to lend because of regulatory change, which has degraded collateral value on banks' balance sheets. Right? And just to summarize that then, so we are where we are. So, so why is ABN Emerald, why is Paribas actually left in a nutshell? They're not, it's just not worth it. Yeah, that's probably, I mean, there's been some historical issues, but if we look at ABN Amaro's statement, which is public, um, part of one of the things that they were um, alluding to, which is a well-known thing, is that Basel IV, which is coming, it was delayed one year, so it's coming starting in 2022, um, collateral value is actually degraded further, i.e. actually what's happening is that you can no longer, the way it's written, no longer use physical commodities as collateral full stop for borrowing or lending, whichever way you're looking. Meaning that this becomes even less economical for banks to lend on these, you know, within these parameters. Yeah, why so would they, right? Like, this is well, it's, it's a weird phenomenon, right? Because it's like you're trying to make the banking system more, more safe using regulation. But actually what this will have to force banks to do is to chase yield over risk. It's exactly like trading. It, 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 it's in the sense that they think, you know, if we to regulate markets more, to stop there being financial traders, proprietary traders, I think that's a good thing because markets will be more about supply and demand or less dictated by financial traders. But then you pull out all these financial traders in oil, for instance, or any another market, you then don't have liquidity. So then you're getting slippage and then you're getting crap prices and you've got increased volatility. You've got all the work you've done to create a sophisticated market has been undone. And it's almost the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, to some extent, I think, you know, you have to be mindful of that regulation has to be broad, right? That's yeah. just as simple as that and to be broad you need to be blunt and you know they they're not thinking at regulatory level oh how does this affect commodities they're talking about the whole banking system it just so happens that certain divisions of banking are affected more than others when you put in implement implement regulation yeah but if we talk specifically about commodities this is quite 
pertinent in terms of where the market is today, which is that if capital is becoming more scarce and becoming more difficult to get hold of from your principal supplier, i.e. banks, and it's becoming less economical for them to lend, so that's exa- you know, the problem is becoming exponential, yeah. the industry as we know it today is going to have to see more of these just simply by arithmetic. If something cannot be afforded, no bank on a return on capital employed methodology is going to continue funding a division that will end up being loss making so under, under certain regulatory conditions. So, you know, well, it's two things. One, the difference between three and four, Basel yeah. three and four. Yeah. But also, what, why, act, why are they acting now? And what does that mean now and the next, say, three years? Because it's... Who? Regulators? No, no, no. The, the bank's pulling out. Right. Because, like, what the debit- because it's about to be implemented. 2022. 2022 is the it's last Basel stage, it's Basel 4. So we've Start. already had the last stage of Basel yeah. 3, and Basel 4 got announced uh, a couple of years ago, but the implementation phase of it start, was meant to start in January this year. Right. It got so delayed one year because of COVID. So it makes sense of the timing, why people are pulling out now. Yeah, because without getting into the depths of it, very simply, if you have to recalibrate your whole banking model and how to calculate how much capital you need to put down, so you're changing from one model to another, that's a lot of investment of time and money. And if the outcome is going to be negative either way, it's better to pull out. By the way, this is a European-centric issue, right? It just so happens that historically, the biggest banks in commodity trade finance are European banks. Mm-hmm. And although people can say, oh, but some revolving credit facilities or, or financing institutions, um, there's like 175 or, 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 or 50 banks in my RCF. Yeah, that may well be true. But RCF. Revolving credit facility, yeah. like it's in committed capital over a period of time. But... That may well be true, but Just most of these, um, most of these, uh, let's say, uh, facilities are led by where the expertise are, which is still within the European banking system, right? These are guys that have been, let's say, in this sector, financing very niche, let's say, uh, specific things since the 70s. Mm. So, you know, it's not just a case of capital, it's also brain drain. You know, if you leave a commodity trade finance bank today, and other banks are looking at getting out, where are you going, right? So, you know, this is kind of kind of a unique space. So in terms of Audentia, where we sit, it's exactly looking at this problem. Well, that's what I was going to say. So you've, you've seen this problem. Yeah. You're at the bank, you so first-hand this transition, right? Yeah. The, the move diminishing away from market-making returns like we talked about. And then now we're talking about uh, implementation over time of Basel III having its impact. And now we're hitting Basel IV. Yeah. So Basel IV seems to have been, the announcement of Basel IV seems to have been the instigator of the not, business. Not solely, but it's, it's definitely part of, because by the way, as part of Basel IV, you also have to further increase your capital okay. base. So you looked at that. And well, I was aware was? of the regulation because I was seeing it from the other side of being a borrower. My physical trading business yeah. basically was using trade finance and you started to see strains in the system yeah. of what things you were or weren't able to do with like let's say little to no equity that's obviously increased dramatically now but you know back when i was at uh, bmp we had a lot of businesses that came in financing vast amounts of money based on the security of the transaction and, and the inherent risk with no equity mm. that was the norm mm. right and you know as a result um this is probably this experience plus that you know the physical trading setting up a business not just trading physical using financing you understand you know, the regulatory impact of this is actually quite profound. And, and you know, so you, you could see this, you could see this coming. You could see that banks were just, it's not gonna be worth it for them. Uh, they're gonna pull out. And I guess what you're saying is rather than, you know, what you expect is a less well-functioning market ultimately because of the regulatory squeeze ultimately, but it's still gonna be required. So Audench is there to plug the gap in essence. In very simple terms, yeah. But I think, you know, if you look at why regulation came in to make the sector more, let's say, or the financial sector more stable, a regulator would argue that we are actually because we're forcing banks to distribute risk. So there's more than one counterparty in I transactions. Think, yeah. So okay. So let's let's just talk through that. So ultimately, in an, in a nutshell, Audencia wants to be. So let me just split the two yeah, the market well, into two places, right? Primary market is synthetic credit structuring. Yeah. So without getting into the structure, but synthetic credit structuring is effectively what we're doing, working directly with corporates. Primary being you're going directly to corporates. Guys that need capital so for their transactions. So oil trader A, A, the guy who was buying... Has a pre-export finance. Uh, no, no, no. So yeah. the, the, the example before Singapore, Australia. 
So trade A in Singapore. Yeah, so let's say keep the same numbers of my one because it will just be easier. 100 and 101, yep. right? Let's say only 50% of their funding can come from a bank for whatever reason. So they're short 50 million of borrowing. Because of Basel IV, the max the bank can offer them is 50 million on that. For argument's sake. Argument's right, sake. right. And is that likely to be the case, 50%? No, 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 no. But, you know, we, we, that, it, look, the, the banking model has got other variables. It's like yeah. tenor, who is the underlying yeah. uh, debtor, so on and so forth. Without okay. getting into specifics Fine. of that. Just As this example, 50%. 50% uh, haircut effectively on the bank side from a regulatory perspective that's the max we can lend to you yep right working directly with corporate would be we will structure a transaction and there's loads of other things we can do at our level to structure that right i mean there's various layers of distributing risk at fund level but principally what is the transaction is we're ultimately going to sh- fill this 50 percent gap yeah now working directly with the corporate means we will work with the trader, which we do with mm-hmm. majors, mm-hmm. right? We, we work with... You know, so you'll work with Trader A in this example, not the bank. Primary market, okay. right? For their physical transaction. Yeah. And, and we will create a way that might not just be cash cover. There are, like I said, there are a number of things in the credit world that you can do to create um, uh, the same sort of payoff, let's say, or the same sort of outcome of them being able to get hold of $100 million worth of capital to buy $100 million worth of oil. So that's the primary market. The more interesting expansive area is the secondary market though. It's taking that risk from banks. It's investing with banks, behind banks, synthetically securitizing that 50%, right? Using various credit structures, right? Mm-hmm. So we're all, the end risk is the same. You're gonna get the trader buying or selling something, but do you go directly to the trader to get that or do you go directly to the bank? And where are you, where are you profiting on the interest? Yeah, effectively. I mean, the return is generated more on the basis of our structures have created a way to get financing. And by the way, it's not just a regulatory capital thing. Don't forget KYC, AML, these sorts of sort of transparency issues within banks have also stopped other types of financing, right? So open credit is quite challenging right now for banks, storage, voyage financing. Um, these are all things that because the fund also has the capacity to handle physical on top, mm. um, we're able to manage structures that, as I said, other credit funds can't do. They don't have those capabilities because they're not commodity focused. So you're blending every facet, credit structuring, financing understanding, derivatives, price risk management, and then physical trading itself in all of the investments. So it, it's how kind does, of- How does physical come into this? You're because your ultimately, where's your risk coming from? A physical transaction, you have to know how that transaction is happening okay. to be able to understand from a risk management perspective, do I want to invest in it? So you're actually picking and choosing the funding you want to do. Yeah. So if you know this Singapore to Asia, sorry to Australia trade is going on, you'll say, yeah, it's a good trade. I can understand it. Therefore, well, in all cases, we would have to obviously understand that it's a precursor. But, but you could turn your nose up at it and say, that's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, it's so generic that it's quite difficult to say, you know, specifically in one deal versus another, what it would be that would make it investable or not. But I'm just talking about the yeah. principle of capturing an opportunity and wider problem. But does that third solve party lending? Just third party lending, yeah. yeah. Does that solve this issue? It starts to, but it's by far not enough. What, look, right now, the funding gap officially, right, from the banking system, I think the Asian Development Bank um, calculated at about one and a half trillion last year. Funding gap, right? That's official, right? I, one and a half trillion doesn't exist. Has been taken out of the banking system, yeah. So the capital squeeze can't, can't be doing what they were doing before. No wonder they're pulling out. What no, no, that? so the banks, so this is because of banks pulling out that you're leaving this funding gap. I see. And now the opportunity for third party investors is, is huge for the risk of the system hasn't changed. But so, the, now, so now, so, so let's envisage the short term future, or medium term future. If this becomes more staple, a company like Audentia, yeah. the oil traders now having to deal with the bank and an Audentia to. That's the optimal, but we yeah. do both, right? Mm. So, what about doing let's 100% say, Audentia? Yeah, so the first layer is creating so structures. So kind of saying it's like you're just replacing banks with... No, but um, that's the big difference actually, because there are things out there, people who are doing that, but mm. that's what I would call alternative or private debt. Mm. These guys are trying to replicate what banks are doing right. as a trade finance fund, okay. right? And they are simply lending directly to the borrowers, right? There's several issues with that business model, right? But principally for an investor, I think number one would be a lot of these guys have never traded physical before. So you're actually interacting with physical traders, but you've never actually physically traded at all. Yeah. 
you've also never worked as an investment bank to do derivatives, right? So there's no derivative risk. It's management. so niche, so granular, that's, that I completely understand. Um, it's actually a lot of the, on the clearing side where, you know, you know Onyx is trading activity. We're market makers, we trade across exchanges, and our actual risk is a lot lower than is being perceived. Perceived versus actual risk. Yeah. Perceived versus actual risk. But the only way you're going to understand that, and you know, we're funded by Eamon Amaro, and they do a very good job of understanding it all. And that gives them a competitive advantage because, as you just said, so the fact that you know you're physical, you, you can spot it and know where the actual risk is versus perceived risk. But for us, you know, to get margin financing, it won't be each bank will look at it a very different way or even each clearing provider will look at it a very different way. And they might see it as a huge amount of risk or not that amount of risk, depending on their understanding. Well, they see the degree, and don't forget, of subjectivity and interpretation. Well, that's what you're saying. So you know, of regulation, that's partly why. You know, you're given a regulation, but you need to interpret it. So again, so Onyx fits into this demise of the banks and market making very well because we actually don't have the proprietary trading restrictions that give us an axe or give us the ability to market make effectively. Yeah. So we can operate within this low margin business. It seems almost exactly the same in that you don't have the constraints of the regulatory side. You can pick and choose the rest of it. That gives you that hole, that gap in essentially. Yeah. Look, there's part of it. I think the big problem, well, not problem, the big layer here is that um, we're working when we're working with a bank within the same regulatory constructs. It's just the difference is because when you're making investments with a bank synthetically, you're buying risk off them, mm. right? And we're not looking to buy out loans or buy out financing structures. We're working really to be sharing risk with the banks, right? They're distributing risk. Yeah. The same way we're working with corporates. But do you think this can help the industry, solve the industry pain it's, point? It's essential. There is, it is the most essential business line there is right now because you, if it, we don't exist, there is no direct funding in, in right. this right now. Right, but none, zero. So there's a one and a half trillion as it stands gap, yeah. which is probably going to increase now. I it has already, yeah. So in the next five years, what does it look like? Well, I think the first layer is the, I say a company like Audentia, which we're specifically investing in things, will start help to plug those gaps, but also in terms of working directly with corporates, help to distribute risk with them to non-bank investors, right? That's the key. You know, you start. Okay, to, so you're actually bringing in the wider market to help fund to help bridge yeah, this well, gap. Yeah, yeah. You, you need to. Someone needs to understand in between all of these facets to make something investable. There's not just thing as an investor. There's a billion different types of investors that look for different things. Realistically, it makes sense because banks people are fed up from 08 all the way. It's still still there. Yeah, but we, the, big, the big thing is, it's still the cheapest source of capital. That's why you'll never wean 100 percent off. So my layer two is. Having both, but Audentious Business Model has already future proof. We want to be in both, right? I understand. Is, you've got two. So, what I think will happen is majors will have funding from the private and the banking market blended together. Yeah, understood. And you get a weighted average cost of capital. I was just trying to make that point is this natural pathway to privatization and bringing in external capital and almost democracy to kind of, but you know, the thing is, is that this isn't a meritocratic issue. The risk of commodity financing has only improved since 08, not got worse. Yeah. Right. Various, you know, regulations. But again, KYC, AML, certain things can't be structured in a certain way in certain jurisdictions. So, so. bottom line is risk. Risk has improved considerably, and banks are a lot better than they were in 08. And I wouldn't even say they were bad in 08, but I'm just saying that, yeah. that this is this is the phenomenon that's been happening. So, really this sort of reduction of capital is interesting in the sense because it's purely based on something arbitrary, regulatory change. It's got nothing to do with the industry. So just to give another take on it then, um, we need this general issue to be solved to some extent to keep the industry alive as we know it, to keep things moving, the rest of it. What does that mean for renewables, LNG, etc.? It is. This is one of the things I say when people talk about the transition to clean energy. It's just how complex and, as you can definitely tell from this conversation, all the moving parts from governing a whole world of moving commodities around. You know, the whole world is governed by these processes and derivative complexes and the rest of it. Just to create that overnight for more renewable sources and cleaner fuels, let's say, like LNG and the rest of it, where does that come into play? Is, is this going to be difficult as well? Is it going to be difficult to, you know, is part of the issue with the regulatory change also going to be made harder by the pressure from climate activists and the rest of it, or politically. Yeah, but I think, you know, you've got to look at probably the biggest single most driver for a lot of these is that commercially are they viable? And part of commercial viability is demand of whatever this product is. And 
than the cost of development. Right. But as simple as that. No, so I just yeah. put that in context of, if that's the calculation principally of any transaction, any long-term financing, any project finance, any infrastructure finance, if they're not viable, a bank's never going to fund it anyway. But so we're talking about very niche. But this is what I'm finding so interesting about the commodities area and, and the push to renewables. The demand is at the you moment. You know that a lot of that's under ESG. That's what I'm trying impact to say. Investing it's, it's, and, for want of a better expression, it's propped up. There's a demand politically to move renewable, but for this market to function properly and to properly service the world's fuel needs with a renewable source is going to need an infrastructure like we have in oil or like we have in commodities in order to do so. And for that to happen, you're going to need, let's just be clear about this, you may want and love the world to be clean and to do these things, but it ultimately most of the world is run in a capitalist sense. We, if banks are going to be involved, they're going to need to be commercially viable operations. Is that likely, I guess, is what I'm asking? Well, or... I'll give you a really, just, just a matter of fact, digital analysis, right? When oil is at 80, a lot of green projects look viable, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're down at 40, they're not anymore. Because you're going to compare it against the next best energy source. But do oil. you think, what do you really think will happen though? Will this political move be pushed into the financing area? Will people get, so you talked about, for instance, this regular, regulatory capital inhibiting banks to have cheap access to capital. Will they give that cheap access to capital to renewables? Because that would be a smart way I mean, to, get to some going. extent, it's already happening, right? It, it, in the sense that government subsidies, you know, there's a lot of sovereign involvement with these type of large-scale energy renewable projects, right? They just have to be because, like I said, the commercial viability on its own is not enough, right? But bear in mind, you're also talking about a very different profile of transaction here, i.e. there isn't one, right? If you're building something from an infrastructure perspective, that's very different to this guy I'm buying from and this guy I'm selling to, and that's what you're funding. And, you know, the reality is, is that it's a bit cheap, this whole clean thing, in the sense that from a moral perspective, we should be weaning off, you know, um, let's say uh, energy and so on and so forth. You know, from a global scale, potentially, yeah, and there should definitely be an active drive to reinvest to, to get there. But you've got to think about what you're doing along the way. Where, do, where does oil come from? Mm. It's not holiday destinations. It's mostly emerging markets, mm. right? So you're effectively saying, let's curb the economic development of various continents and countries mm. for us in the Western world to have clean fuels, right? That's ultimately what the payoff is. Agreed. And no, but I say that if you put financial issues, like financing issues, on top of that, that becomes now a very different premise on the moral scale, right? Yeah. And the UN itself has come out many times and said the biggest differentiator or the biggest factor of getting from uh, an emerging market into you know, let's say the developed world, is access to finance, access to capital. Mm. It's number one. So I guess that's what I was going to ask then. So within commodities in particular, is it not likely that or should the Eastern banks be getting involved more, given that's where the growth is? Well, it's actually starting to happen. So if we talk about banks outside of the Basel construct, the right? yeah, Basel yeah. constructs, mm. you know, you do have other jurisdictions. They're not actually that less punitive. I mean, for instance, APRA, the Australian regulator, um, is probably more punitive from a regulatory perspective than uh, the PRA in, in UK and, and, and uh, uh, Basel across Europe. But that said, you've got to look at another f factor here, which is it's actually quite interesting. It's when I was talking about brain drain, um, people who have been, let's say, educated across transactions in Europe, EMEA, CIS as a function, they have built up expertise, market knowledge, market understanding, right? Although balance sheet may have to go to the Middle East or may have to go to Asia, which it has been doing, um, and a lot of Asian banks have been stepping in these you know, revolving credit facilities and so on and so forth, the question would be, do they have the same expertise? And it's a resounding no, right? Mm. Because it's not possible for one to know the whole world of trading mm. if you've never even been in Asia, you've spent your whole life in Europe. So I guess this transfer of skills to non-European banks is exactly what needs to happen next, which is balance sheet will have to go there, but can the expertise go there, right? And if they're already starting to finance things, yeah. this is kind of where oh, it's going. Yeah, that cool. plus funds specifically designed to do this, that there is an expertise element to that, right? But then that's what I'm saying, going back to the renewables side of things, creating an expertise within that when it's not even exist. So emerging markets is what's continuing to have commodity growth and needing to trade and need to plug the trade finance gap. Yeah. But then if these, this is where all the old demands coming from, we need them to be using more renewables, which means they, but you're saying there's a lack of expertise within the commodity trade finance 
in Eastern world, in the Eastern side of the world it's, for oil, but then how can we expect them, firstly, they need to be educated on that, then they need to create their own funding or expertise and funding it's, for it, expertise, renewables. Expertise is, is more of a case of, it's not an education thing, it's that a bank, if it wasn't historically doing that type of business, which is quite technical, they need to get the people who were doing it to do it properly, right? It's not just a case of having balance sheet. If you take a big, big Asian bank, right? Pick one, could be a big regional one in Singapore, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Just because it's got big balance sheet and it's not restrained the same way European balance sheets are, and cross-border trade in Asia is as big, if not bigger than Europe, right? Just because it has balance sheet doesn't mean it actively wants, is seeking to deploy into commodity financing. And the reason why is because they might not have the personnel yet, yet, mm -hmm. right? Now, that'll be what take, it takes to, to have more expansive financing from the Asian banks and, and Middle Eastern banks. But by the way, that's been happening if you look at the construction of revolving credit facilities for major traders over the last 10 years. It was almost exclusively European for the last, you know, for 10 years, 10 years ago or more. And now I would say, you know, in absolute terms, it could be less than 40%, right? So you've already seen the shift. It's just like, I'm not aware, oh well, I'm, I'm I'm not certain everyone is aware of that the reasons for that. And it's mm. principally regulatory change, right? Again, mm. there are some other bells and whistles, like you know, uh, things that you can and can't do from a regulatory perspective, being KYC, AML, mm. transparency, and so on and so forth. But in terms of pure commercial lending, the cost of it is going up and it's becoming more difficult and it's less, it's more scarce, sorry. Mm. And, and that is the simple effects, right? So that has to translate onto issues into to lending and ultimately, Derivatives is not precluded from this. You yeah. Know? So, um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting time because we're in another transition period, probably the biggest one since 08. That's what I was going to say. After you know going through all this, understanding it, it's, it almost raises more questions than it answers, especially in this time. So, hugely educational. But I think that uh, you know I'm impressed if people have stuck with this. It's, it's a very complex area, niche area, but ultimately very very important. Um, so well, just to give you some numbers, right? We're talking about an industry. If it's got a funding gap of one point five, what's the industry worth? The industry's worth in all forms of commodity financing. I'm talking about invoice factoring as unofficial official, mm. about twenty trillion. Yeah. So, so we talk about Brexit and these sorts of Mickey Mouse things relative to yeah. global trade. Yeah. Where is that coming from? Right? Yeah. How are things moving? How are things going to be bought, sold? And then raw materials: wheat, sugar, barley, rice. Gasoline, vacuum gas oil, fuel oil, diesel, all this comes under commodities, right? And, and all the metals, you know, iron ore, zinc, nickel, this is all the world of commodities. So like impacts here are actually quite profound globally, right? Yeah. So I think we'll probably leave it there. There's more than enough, uh, you know, so much detail, so much to pontificate on. Honestly, thanks very much for coming in. I know obviously you're very busy doing so many things these days. Uh, and you know hopefully there's so much more to discuss and as we transition maybe get you on again to discuss it but yeah i think that probably the best the highest impact would be you know now there's an overview it's kind of more as things happen in sort of segments yeah, financing absolutely. what's happening with derivatives specifically with mm. regulatory change mm. so on and so forth this opportunity to invest so on you know that's kind of i think where this kind of let's say these type of discussions can always go because yeah. They are now, they are real, right? And things mm -hmm. are happening every day. And as I said, that is regulation for you. Surprised how little is mentioned.